Blessed to be with you guys this morning. Let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 10. And today we're going to be looking and studying verses 46 down to verse 52. So let me read that. And we'll have a word of prayer and then we will dive in. Then they came to Jericho, Jesus and his team. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. But Jesus stood still and commanded him to be quiet commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. It's a great story. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you're a healing God, you're a loving God. You're a God that's concerned with people's lives, and Lord, you're a God that answers prayer. One way or the other, you always answer prayers, Lord, and, but you want us, and you commanded us to pray, to seek you out, to pour out our hearts to you. And so, Lord, show us uh, the heart of this passage, Lord. Show us the heart of it, God that we need to be people that seek you, that are desperate for you, that are praying and earnestly following after you, Lord. So bless your word to our hearts, we pray, God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. When you see that little prefix, bar, bar Timaeus, B-A-R, it's a prefix uh, in the Hebrew language, which means son of. So bar Timaeus is son of Timaeus. Just a little extra credit for you guys, so you can you know, score points at Bible trivia games and that kind of thing, so very important stuff. We see a man here that's desperate for healing. We see a man here that was asking for something less and got something more. We see a man here that won't be held back, he won't be deterred, he won't be frustrated or defeated by his surroundings in regards to coming to Jesus and, and receiving his sight. Just want to go through the notes with you guys here, so if you want to follow along, I want to consider the life of Bartimaeus. Consider what it meant to be blind in that culture. What were the implications? What were the stigmas that were attached to blindness? We are told that he has uh, physical blindness, and so he obviously has a tremendous need to see. If he came from a family that accepted him unconditionally, then and he had a comfortable home and, and you know, a huge uh, circle of friends and, and even if there was some kind of government welfare for him or some support, if he had everything else in place, uh, think of the best case scenario for a person who is incapacitated in one way or another. Uh, but, but if he had all of that and was still blind, it would still be hard. And we're not told if he was born blind or if he had an accident or some... Uh, you know, slowly, gradually progressing disease or something like that. We're not told how this happened. We're just simply told that he was blind. But I want you to just think about it. If everything else was great in his life, he's still blind. And so he's at a disadvantage. He, he needs help somehow at some time, in some way, with some things. We're not told how much he was getting. But I want you to also think of the possibilities because we find him by the road begging. And so probably not everything, not every advantage that could be had was being enjoyed and experienced by him. What was his life like because of his blindness? If you've helped people in the past and, and if you've helped people with long-term uh, disabilities or you know, they're, they're sick or uh, there's financial problems or there's behavior that makes life difficult or whatever the case is, but that somebody that needs help regularly, long-term long and ongoing, and if you've ever been that kind of caregiver, you know, uh, you know, with the best intentions and with the greatest heart and a heart full of emotions and love and compassion and all of that, you still get tired. It, it, it wears on you. I, I heard in the last couple of years that 
people that do regular caregiving, and this isn't just like for a living, I'm sure doing it for a living, you know, an eight hour, 10 hour, 12 hour shift and all of that, you really have to invest yourself, but somebody who's trying to hold down a job, come home, care for somebody, and as this thing goes on and on and on, you know, um, it takes years off of your life because it's just emotionally and physically and mentally and spiritually draining, psychologically, you just get depleted. Um, and so my point is, it's just simply hard. And, and so were there people that volunteered to help him for a while and then they just couldn't? I mean, it's, all of this is possible. We're not told any of this. I'm just speculating, but I, I, I like to have a, what I call a sanctified imagination. This didn't happen in a vacuum. It wasn't some kind of sterile laboratory or a college classroom or some kind of case study. This was a guy, you know, 2,000 years ago, give or take, who was blind and sat by the road begging. What was his life like? You have to think about these things. So it could, could very well be that he didn't have a support system and that he was just there doing the best he could, living off of people's gratitude and generosity, getting a little here, getting a little there. We're told over in the Gospel of Matthew that he was with another guy, so there was two of them, but Bartimaeus seems to be the standout here. And so Mark fo focuses primarily on Bartimaeus. So his life had to be hard in a lot of ways. I think with any, any of us, you know, we have dreams and hopes and plans and all of that, and how many of those had gone unfulfilled? What if he had become blind during life, it came on gradually, and he has this, impending gloominess coming to him and just as the years pass it comes to him and there's just this you know great discouragement and a great giving up and it goes on in his heart don't know to top all of that off however any of those things were true there were social and cultural and spiritual hardships now this is really terrible in that day and we read about it in john chapter 9 um, in that day, the Jewish people believed that blindness was, was oftentimes a result of sin. And so you can look at here, John chapter 9, verse 2. Uh, the disciples asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That was the prevailing thought among Jewish people. And so they, they thought that a man could be struck with blindness because he sinned, or a man could, be, could sin in the womb that's kind of crazy, sin in the womb and, and be born blind, or that his parents sinned grievously and that resulted in, in God cursing their child with blindness. Guys, that's one of the, the most awful, unanswerable questions and suggestions that you could ever hear. There's no answering that. You know, uh, Jesus went on to tell them, neither, none of that is the case. But look at chapter 9, verse 2. Disciples asked him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What if Bartimaeus was stuck with that thought all of his life? What if that's the kind of thing that people are asking him? What if, what if as he's begging by the road, people are walking by and they're saying, you know, it's probably your fault that you're born blind, or I heard about your dad, I know what your mom's like, and I know what your family background is like, and you're born, born blind because of them, or you're born blind because of you, or this blindness came upon you because, and there's all this speculation, and none of it's grounded in fact. What's going on in his head? This is going on in his head up here. This is like, you guys know what that means, right? Your head is just spinning. You don't know what to believe. You don't know what to think. Should I, be, should I be angry with dad? Should I be angry with mom? Should I be angry with myself that I did something before I had consciousness in the womb? That I, I don't know what I did, but should I be angry with God? You people quit blaming me and quit telling me you think you know why this happened. Guys, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on. And so we know that that's the case because we read about it in John chapter 9. I have suggested here in the notes, you can look, he lived in a no man's land. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, he was in darkness. Not many, if any, wanted him for a number of reasons. I don't want to get involved. It looks like a long-term project. I'm taking care of my own family. I don't want to get involved with that guy. Who knows what he did? Who knows what his parents did? I don't want to get involved with that guy. He has a stigma upon him. It might get attached to me. I'll be guilty by association. I don't want to get involved with that guy. And so he's just with another guy like him who may be asking, asking all the same questions and has the same needs and apparently the same lack of support of a, of a support system 
And they're all going through this together. He was accepted by his own kind, outcasts. What if he did believe the lies about his blindness? And those are just unanswerable questions. And and it's, it's torturous. There was no way to know these things. He could have had guilt with self. He could have had bitterness with parents and God. It's unanswerable. Imagine the torment. Does it say that? No. Do we know that about the culture? Yeah. Do we know that about human nature? Yeah, we do. There's a verse that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and he, and he said this, basically. There's no temptation that, that has, except that which is common to man. There's no temptation except that which is common to man. He's just basically, the Apostle Paul tells us, there's a commonality among us. That what I suffer with in one way, shape, or form, you suffer with. Whether it be loneliness or, uh, you know, uh, unforgiveness or whatever the case may be. There's so much that's common among us. So when I read something like this and I think about these things, I think God has given me and us a little bit of permission to imagine what it might have been like. Mark doesn't have to give the first century readers those kinds of details because they knew it. That was the culture they lived in. You said blind man by the road. Everybody knew all the implications. We don't. We have to study these things. We have to read about history, culture, all those kinds of things. But that's what Bartimaeus was living in and the guy that was with him. It was a terrible, terrible situation. In in a similar way, and today I'm just very simply trying to draw parallels between Bartimaeus and our lives because we need to make application, right? This isn't just a story to bounce around in our head and, and just walk out of here you know, uh, with no application to our own lives. Bartimaeus had physical needs. Some of us still have physical needs, physical healing. The Bible tells us that God heals. Does he heal all the time in this life? No, he doesn't. Does he sometimes? Absolutely. If you're a Christian, you're going to be healed eventually. Anybody can say amen if you want to on that one. You know, I, I've gotten migraines for 40 years. They're getting better as long as I stay away from corn tortilla or flour tortillas and those sin things out in the donut box and those, those pink boxes are just full of sin. <laughs> I have a gluten intolerance, you know, but sometimes I think, well, I'm probably healed from it, so I'll just, you know, if one donut's good, five, five is better, right? And it's a headache. And, and then, you know, some of you are very sympathetic. I hope you feel better. I can always say, you know what, I will. I will feel better. We're all gonna feel better if you're in Christ. You're gonna be healed. You're gonna have a new body. Sometimes God does healing now in this life. Some of us have experienced that in various degrees. Look at, look at James chapter 5. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. I do believe there is a link sometimes between spiritual uh, wandering and and illness that comes into our lives confess your trespasses to one another pray for one another that you may be healed the effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much Uh, we have this little bottle of oil over here if you ever need prayer for healing come up and let us just dab put a little there's no magic in the oil a little dab of oil on on you because it says to anoint people with oil pray for them and we'll just present your situation before the lord and he'll heal you now or he'll heal you later if you're in Christ. So like Bartimaeus, we have physical needs. Besides physical needs, we have other needs. Finances, housing, transportation. Bartimaeus had housing problems, probably. He definitely had financial problems, didn't he? Because he was begging. Jesus told us to seek him, to ask him. Matthew 6 Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. When he says Gentiles there, it's not a racial thing. It's people that don't have faith. Jesus was speaking to the nation of Israel, the people of God. He's basically saying, that's how unbelievers think. People that don't know the Lord often worry about how are they going to pay the rent, how are they going to pay the mortgage, how are we going to pay the bills, how are we going to pay the insurance, all those things. And Jesus is basically saying, don't be like a person with no faith. Be a person of faith. And and he goes on to explain what that faith looks like. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Guys, look at verse 33. Hang it around your neck. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. How much worry do we put forth in our lives because we're not seeking first the kingdom of God? Bartimaeus had physical needs. We have physical needs. Bartimaeus had situational needs. We have situational needs. We've been given a prescription. We've been given direction from Jesus himself to, to ask him and to seek him. And to not seek first for ourselves, but seek, seek him first. It's been said, I don't know who said it, but, but whoever said it, they said, they said it well, don't seek his hand, seek his face. Don't seek what he wants to provide. Seek him, and he'll provide. And if he doesn't provide, then you probably don't need it. And so those, the parallels there are, are easy to see. I listed also the needs of the soul. We suffer damage in our souls. There are hurts done against us, and there are hurts that we do to ourselves. We damage our emotions and our psyche. We damage our thought life. And other people damage us. We, we carry around stuff in our heads and our hearts. Bartimaeus was carrying around stuff, and he couldn't even be sure if it was valid or not. He couldn't be sure if he caused it or if somebody else caused it. We carry around sometimes emotional struggles and psychological struggles and spiritual and mental and wrong thinking, all these things. And I'm not talking about organic mental illness, which I do believe exists as a result of the fall. I'm talking about the stuff that we pick up through life. You're victimized as a child or you go through a terrible uh, divorce or, or uh, you know, people betray you or, or you mess up your life so much that you drive everybody away or whatever the case is, there are soul needs that we have. We need, we need healing in those areas too. Well, look at your notes, guys. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. This is amazing to me. Bartimaeus had soul needs. We have soul needs. Look at what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. That word means to separate, to separate unto himself. So let me, let me uh, paraphrase. May the God of himself set you apart for himself completely. May, may, may your life be completely just set apart from God. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God, in my paraphrase, may God have every part of you. May he work in you in such a way that it's all set apart from him. And I love this, that the, the, the Apostle Paul is talking about spirit, soul, and body. God's concerned about all of it. He's concerned about your body. He's concerned about your emotions, the soul, the desires, the disappointments. He's concerned about your spirit, that thing that comes alive when we are born again and when we have a connection with God. He's concerned about the entire you and the entire me. The word soul, the word there, the seed of feelings, desires, affections, the heart and the soul. And then look at the next verse in 1 John 3, verse 2. John writes to some Christians and he says, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Let me ask you today, go, let, me, let me go back to that. Uh, yeah, let's all turn back to the first page, shall we? Ready? Here we go. Are you prospering in the seat of your feelings? Are you prospering in your desires? Are you prospering in your affections? Are you prospering emotionally, psychologically? Are you prospering? Are you healthy in the way that you think? Are you healthy in the way that you perceive people? Or are there things that have been kind of uh, downloaded into you that make you view the world uh, negatively or resentfully or anything like that? The Apostle John says that we can prosper in our soul. And I have to think Bartimaeus, if, if what we know historically and culturally is true about blind men, was he was suffering physically, he was suffering financially, very very probably, in my opinion, suffering in his soul. Why did this happen to me? Did I do it? Did my mom do it? Did my dad do it? God, did you just randomly choose somebody to, to afflict? So there's the, are you guys with me? Yeah. yeah. There's a lot going on here, you guys. 
First century would have got this right off. We need to stop and consider it a little bit. Bartimaeus was really suffering. And there were people around him that said he probably deserved it. The most important thing that needs to prosper is our salvation, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, the promise of heaven. You know, if there's a person here today that hasn't said yes to Jesus, that's where it starts with you. Most of this message is kind of tailored to those who know Jesus already, encouraging us to, to cry out to the Lord, to pray, to seek God, to understand that he cares about spirit, soul, and body. But for some of us, maybe we haven't even crossed the threshold yet into a relationship with God, and Jesus is calling out to you to come to him. And that's where it needs to start for you so that he can begin to do his work in you. Now, I want you to consider, and I've already been alluding to this, and we don't have to go into it too much. There was opposition against those two blind men. Undoubtedly, some in the crowd thought them unworthy and undeserving of Jesus' help. Look at verse 48. Then many warned him to be quiet. Be quiet, Bartimaeus. May I, may I, may I put it in my own street vernacular? Shut up. Shut up, Bartimaeus. Je we're here with Jesus. You shut up over there. You probably brought this upon yourself. That's your problem. It's a little too late for you. Just be quiet over there, you and your blind buddy. He has nothing to do with you. You have nothing to do with them. Just, just keep to yourself. So there was opposition there based on culture, based on a wrong understanding of God. There's opposition against us, as if we didn't know, right? <laughs> Satan is opposed to you. Satan hates you. Satan hates me. Satan hates the church of Jesus Christ. Satan hates God and all that is good. Look at your notes, guys. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Peter writes to Christians, and he says, Be sober. Be sober-minded. Be, be able to view the world clearly and think clearly. Have a clear head. That's just one of many reasons why it's good to not be abusing, abusing substances. Have a clear head. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be careful. Be watchful. Because your adversary, the devil, walked, walks about like a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. So we have spiritual opposition. Guys, if I told you, you know, we have to go this direction, but that's an old minefield right there, You'd probably tell me to go first. <laughs> but you, you'd pick your steps carefully. That's what Peter's saying. You need to pick your steps carefully. You need to watch what you're doing. You need to watch who you're becoming friends with and the places you're choosing to go, the things you're choosing to do, the things you're choosing to listen to and watch and all those other things because there's one called Satan and he wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. Also, we live in a world system People that don't know the truth about Jesus Christ, a lot of them good people, nice people, well-intentioned people. I'm not going to stand up here and bash unbelievers, not at all, because there's a lot of nice people in the world. But if they don't have the truth of God, then, then they can't give us the best advice, can they? Look at the notes there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says to the church at Corinth, he says, even if our gospel is veiled... The truth about Jesus, if some people can't see it, it's veiled to those who are perishing. So there's a group of people in the world that hear about Jesus and they're just blind to it. And, and Paul says, unfortunately, right now they are in the condition of passing away into a, into a Christless eternity. But notice, verse 4, whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the glory uh, excuse me, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should, sh should shine on them. So there's a blindness among a lot of people. I'm going to ask you guys a question. The answer is yes. I want you to feel good about yourself this morning. <laughs> Was Bartimaeus probably getting some bad advice? Yeah. yeah. They were, they were raised in a culture thinking that a blind guy was probably his fault. And so they were, he was, they were probably giving him bad counsel. Uh, maybe, maybe even something like this. Look at Bartimaeus, you know, we're friends. I've known you for a long time. And you just, you know, you just need to accept the fact that you probably just did this to yourself and get on with your life. There's no basis for that. 
That was probably a lie, a well-intentioned lie that they were giving to him, trying to help. So you can just get on with yourself, just, you know, ask God to forgive you for what you did. You don't even know what you did. Just ask, you know, or, you know forgive your parents. And bad, bad advice, not based in truth. That's what Bartimaeus was having to go through. Guys, isn't that what we go through? You might be struggling physically, you're getting bad advice. You might be struggling financially, you're getting bad advice. Well-intentioned people, you're getting bad advice. You might be struggling in your soul, and you're getting bad advice. And maybe it's something that somebody did to you, but somebody's telling you you did it to yourself. And you just need to forgive yourself. Did you know the Bible doesn't say to forgive yourself? The Bible says to receive forgiveness. That's like me getting a ticket going before the judge. The judge says, Mr. Walden, you're guilty. Oh, it's okay, Your Honor. I forgive myself. <laughs> Try that. <laughs> it doesn't work. The one with the authority is the one who forgives. God has the authority. He is the one that we need forgiveness from, right? But we'll, we have well-intentioned people telling us the wrong thing. Why? Paul says because they're blind. Even Christians who aren't currently reading their Bibles and moving more on emotion than on biblical truth can give bad advice. None of that's going to help Bart blind Bartimaeus. None of it's going to help you. And then there are people that'll say, you did it to yourself, and maybe you did. And maybe you didn't. And we don't know. Guys, I want to encourage you. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not against asking some healthy questions you know, about my own life. I'm, you know, I don't, I don't think we should never ask questions about our lives, but, but at some point, I think sometimes, you know what, the questions are unanswerable. If you've been asking for a long time, why did this happen to me? Maybe you should just stop asking. Because I think the enemy of your souls would be happy to keep you chasing yourself chasing your, your own tail, going in circles, wondering why this happened to you instead of breaking out of it and saying, Lord, I, I need to see. You need to make me better. You need to heal me. You need to heal me physically, Lord. I know you will someday. Could you do it now? I'm hurting financially. I'm hurting psychologically. I need your help now. Instead of trying to figure out why this thing happened, maybe you just need to quit asking that question. Maybe it'll be helpful, I don't know. God needs to lead you and guide you. Bartimaeus didn't stop with, with any of those things. He just said, Lord, I want to see. I need to see. He was asking for money, and Jesus had more for him, right? right. Jesus had more. I forget where I got the quote. Someone said the crowd had eyesight, but Bartimaeus had insight. He understood. Jesus can make me better. And I hope you understand all the things I've stacked up, all the reasons that Bartimaeus could have quit. I'm sick of being a beggar. I'm just going to die. Um, I'm sick of my psychological weirdness. I'm sick of getting blamed. I'm sick of being blind. I'm sick of all this stuff, and the people are telling me to shut up. I'm just going to go, you know, uh, go lay in a field and just die because I'm sick of it. But he didn't. He cried out. He cried out to the Lord. And he starts with the term, David, son of, da uh, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. And, it, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a real formal term. Son of David is a real kind of a title. And the people are saying, shut up, Bartimaeus, just shut up. And he says, no, I'm not going to shut up. And then Jesus hears and he says, what do you want me to do? And it's like, are you kidding me? But Jesus wants to draw, him out, draw it out of him. And maybe Jesus is asking some of you guys today, what do you want me to do for you? Well, I don't know if this is my fault. I didn't, I'm not here to ask, answer that. What do you want me to do for you? What needs to change in you? What needs to be healed in you? What do you want me to do for you? And then he says, Rabboni, which means dear teacher. Now it's getting personal. Dear teacher, I want to see let me see. He wouldn't be held back. Look at verse 50, you guys. You don't do this if you're blind. <laughs> Apparently Bartimaeus didn't know. 
And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. If he was a blind man, if he's begging, well, he, not, we, he was a blind man. As a beggar, that may have been his only shelter. That may have been all that he had. In the Old Testament, it says if you take a pledge from somebody, if they owe you money or something like that, and you take their cloak, give it back to him by the time the sun goes down. Because that might be the only protection that he has. Bartimaeus threw it all aside. He, he threw aside all the self-preservation. He threw aside all the self-protection. He let go of his, maybe one of his greatest resources and just said, Lord, I need to see. And this thing's holding me back. Lord, I need you to heal my mind. Then set aside that friend that's holding you back. Set aside that habit that's holding you back. Lord, I need you to, to help me have finances so I can take care of my family. Then set aside those things that are holding you back. Well, I can't seek you early in the morning because I really need to do... No, seek first the kingdom of God. Set aside those things. But, but set aside those things. Bartimaeus just said, forget it all. You're what I need. Jesus met these men with compassion. Look at Matthew 20, verse 34. It's in your notes. It says that Jesus had compassion, a deep emotion. We read that in the parallel passage. Jesus healed because of compassion. He cared about this guy. Jesus was, please guys, connect the dots. Be thinking Christians today. He cared about this guy that had a social, religious, cultural stigma against him. Some, some might, in the crowd might even say, Jesus, why are you associating with that man? He probably brought it on himself. He needs to suffer. This is the righteous indignation of God. Some would have maybe rebuked Jesus for being with this guy and seeking him out. But Jesus was just full of compassion. Jesus is, compa is full of compassion for us. Even if you can't figure out why it is the way it is or even if you did it to yourself, or even if somebody else did it to you. We are told in Luke chapter 18, verse 43, after Jesus <clears throat> heals these two men, heals Bartimaeus, that the crowd gave praise to God. And I think the crowd in this room gives praise to God as we see people getting healed. Amen? There's, a, there's some good stories in this room of people coming to Jesus and just saying, you know what, I've tried this and this and this and this, and my, I was in one of those categories, and forget it all, Jesus, I need to see. Jesus, I need to think right. Jesus, I need to break free of addiction. Jesus, I need to be holy. I need to keep my body for you and not spread it around town. Jesus, I need to live for you. I'm sorry about that. I need you to do this, Lord. I'm throwing everything else away. You and only you are, are the answer for me. And, and when we've seen that in this church, guys, the crowd, the crowd gives praise to God. Amen? And we've seen it in this church. We've seen Bartimaeuses regain what they were lacking. I don't know the female version of Bartimaeus, or else I would say it. Bartimaeus? We've seen men and women get healed up here because they threw aside their garment. Look at your notes. I just want to wrap this up. If you have any questions, and Joe, are you still, you're still in the room? We're going to have a closing song in a minute here. Look at your notes. I'm just going to read. Against public opinion... And myriads of possible doubts and bitterness, Bartimaeus has faith in Jesus publicly, and he would not be held back. He may have been confused about why he was blind, but he moved in faith. He didn't blame himself or parents or God, and bitterness didn't stop him. Bartimaeus would not only be healed physically, but now he's going to follow Jesus now he's able to bless others instead of being independent. And we've seen that in this room. He, people going from a place of being needy all the time to the place where they're givers because their life is overflowing, because God's pouring into them and it's coming out. Bartimaeus, culturally speaking, you guys, was just like, man, if I get involved with that guy, that's a black hole right there. 
there'll be no end of taking care of this guy. He's going to drain me of everything. And it all turned around, I'm sure, in Bartimaeus' life as he began to follow Jesus and give to people. And like I said, I'm just so blessed that we've seen that happen here in this church. Is there a healing that Jesus wants to do, but he doesn't? Because you or I don't ask. We listen to the crowd, we're intimidated by them, and we believe the lies. We don't come to faith, and Jesus isn't Rabboni to us. He's not dear to us. I've had some, some uh, knee surgeries over the years, and I, I appreciate orthopedics. <laughs> But I remember what it was like walking with a limp all the time because my legs were kind of a mess, you know? And now I'm really uh, sensitive to, walking, to watching people who walk with a limp. And I can see their biomechanics bio are off and they're kind of high shoulder, or the hips kind of twisted, or they're kind of walking. And, you know, I mean, our bodies, we're not made of steel. I mean, there's a little part of me that's made of steel, but the rest isn't. Everything else is going to rot. And, uh, but I'm real sensitive to, the, to, to that thing where I, I see somebody and I can kind of see, wow, they're really struggling physically, they're, but they've learned to walk with a limp. And then I think emotionally and psychologically and spiritually, we just learned to walk with a limp. We just get used to it. But maybe today Jesus is saying, what do you want me to do for you? I don't know, guys. But I think Jesus is in the business of healing, right? He's in the business of healing. James tells us in chapter 4, verse 2, you do not have because you do not ask. There's one other thing to notice Bartimaeus needed help from people to get to Jesus. And maybe some of us resist other people, letting God use other people to get us to him. But maybe somebody wants to pray for you in your life, or somebody wants to counsel you, or somebody wants to bring you to a, another study, or uh, to a men's conference, or the ladies' studies that are starting up. And maybe God has a healing for you right around the corner, but you've just learned to walk with a limp. And somebody's inviting you, and somebody's inviting you, and somebody's inviting you. It's like, nah, I'm not going to go. I'll just stay home with my limp, you know? But Jesus might be asking you as they are inviting you, what do you want me to do for you? What is it that you need? Are there any questions today? Can we assume that Timaeus, the father of Bartimaeus, may have had a social position of some moderate importance? Um, I, I haven't read anything about that yet. It seems most people with some sort of social position are mentioned by name in the Bible was this mentioned because it's important to know the depth of Bartimaeus' suffering and shame. Maybe. I don't know. It may have just been that Bartimaeus, I mean, Jesus says your faith has made you well. So uh, I don't know if his dad was anybody of notoriety, but, but Bartimaeus became someone of notoriety because of his faith. So that may have been the reason why he's, it's a very good question, that may have been the reason why he's uh, named and, and brought forth in such a way as he was. Anything else? The question, why do some people have to suffer and others not? My answer, when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, caused some people to be born blind or diseased, etc., the cause of suffering was from the fall of Adam and Eve, is my answer, biblical truth. I believe that is a, an answer, a biblical answer. Um, God said to Adam and Eve, the, the day that you eat of that fruit, uh, you'll surely die. And in the Hebrew, it means dying, you shall surely die. In other words, death came into the world, and we're told that also in the book of Romans, that the, the, you know, apparently Adam and Eve could have gone on forever. But because of sin, death came to the body. And so I believe all the things that, that are incorporated in, in uh, causing a person to pass away also began to develop all the diseases and all those things. So I think that's a, an appropriate answer. After 30 or 45 minutes of worship, here I am ready to move on to the rest of the service. Is it wrong of me to, as, as a well-established Christian of many years, wonder about the goodness of worshiping God all day, every day, forever in heaven? I think that's a, I think that's a really a great thing to think about. 
Oh, I think the question is you're, you're tired of singing. Oh, okay. Well, you know, we're just not perfect yet, are we? We're not in heaven yet. In case you didn't notice. <laughs> um, you know, the Bible says, as a father pities his children, so, the, so, the, so God pities us. He knows we're just dust. And so we get tired, we get headaches, we get distracted. I don't like this song, I don't like that song. We get in worship wars. Uh, I don't think we're going to have any trouble worshiping Jesus in heaven. There is a great hymn that I know a lot of you like. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So I think God understands the allowances of our physical weaknesses and our emotional, psychological, mental weaknesses. But also maybe we need a fresh vision of who Christ is. And then we won't be distracted by other things. I love at weddings when the bride walks down the aisle and the groom's right here, you know. Guess what? He's not looking at anybody. Not nobody else. Just, that's my woman. You know? <laughs> it's just like, wow. You know, he's totally unaware of everything else. He's just looking at his, at, at his bride. And I think that's what we need to do with Jesus, increasingly. So don't beat yourself up over that, whoever wrote it. God understands. But are you getting as much Jesus as, as maybe you could? So, My work environment is in construction can be harsh and profane the majority of the time. I've asked them to stop and they don't. I pray and it definitely helps. Good. Even though I pray the profane talk stays in our minds after we hear it, what would your advice be if it's affecting our souls? Well, um, I think it's great that you're praying. I don't, I don't think we can expect unbelievers to act like believers. We just read today that the God of this age has blinded their minds so that the, the truth of the gospel is, is, is not seen by them. And so um, you can't expect unbelievers to act like a Christian. Um, you need to fortify yourself and uh, strengthen yourself for that job. And if God has you in that job, if God has you in a, in a job where it's tough, if God has you there, then he'll give you the grace to, to stay there. And uh, if you can't stay there, either he hasn't called you to be there or you're not being strong in his grace. Paul told Timothy, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Paul told the Corinthians, don't take the, don't take the grace of God in vain. So God's grace is his enabling to be in a place or a situation, and he strengthens you beyond your own strength. So there's grace to be depended on. Maybe a person isn't depending on that grace, or maybe God hasn't called a person into that position, and so he hasn't given him the grace to be in that position. And so that, that's where Paul says in Philippians, you need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You just need to work it out. You need to pray and be patient and, uh, you know, don't ex I said it two times already. Don't expect unbelievers to act like believers. You know, that's that's unreasonable. So, and, and and fill out a prayer card and let us pray for you. Should faith be tempered with reason? I think so. I think yeah, absolutely. I don't think reason should predominate over faith. Is there a danger of having too much faith where a person might feel called? to do unreasonable and ultimately de detrimental things in the name of God. Well, I think if you look at faith just for what it is, sometimes it does seem unreasonable. God told Abraham, leave your country and come to a land that I will show you. And so God said to Abraham, leave your, leave your family behind and just start following me. Well, where are, you gonna, where are we going, Lord? I'll show you. And we want to have all the plans laid out. Not wrong to plan, but God doesn't always let us plan. God said to, to, to Abraham, take your son, your only son, and, and offer him as a sacrifice to me. And that was culturally acceptable in those days. People would offer their firstborn to the, to the pagan uh, deities of the land of the Canaan, Canaanites. But Abraham had a strong sense that God, and God, God had promised your offspring is going to be like the stars of heaven. And it says that Abraham believed that God would even raise his son from the dead. That, none of that makes sense at all. 
I don't think it's right for us to be stupid and foolish and say we did it in faith. But I also don't think that if God's leading us to do something and it, and it doesn't seem to be logical, that we should discount it. Because faith doesn't always look logical. It didn't look logical for Peter to step out of the boat and walk on the water. And so faith, faith goes beyond human logic, but let's not use faith as an excuse forgive me for our stupidity and foolishness. So that has to be worked out. My goodness, you guys are going for it today, aren't you? Is this like from the last four weeks or something? Do we know through church history what happens to Bartimaeus? Not, not that we know. Have you ever read anything on that, Rob? No? The front row says no. Joe's going to lead us in a song. I just want you to, you know, we're just going to sing. We're not going to invite anybody forward today. What is it that Jesus wants to do for you? If, if, he, if he came to you right now, and he essentially is, and just says, what is it that you want? You can just spend, spend this time right now telling him. You don't have to figure it out. You just ask him and keep asking him until he answers. Lord, we present ourselves to you, and we thank you for your grace and mercy. You're a good, good God, Lord. And um, whatever our situation is today, if somebody else did it or we did it to ourselves or, or there's no answer, uh, it doesn't change who you are. You're a good God. And so, Lord, uh, we ask that you'd have your hand upon us. We pray that we would be wise and full of faith to not let anything keep us uh, from you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.